um, who wants to go first? Who was, who were the teams again? It was um, Emily, Lindsay, Beth, and, and Naya. Okay. Um, anybody want to volunteer? Beth, do you want to go? Yeah, we can go. Okay. Should, so I guess one of us should just share our screen. Yeah, Scott, who, who has permission? Oh, nobody right now. Uh, but I can give it to everybody. So you, I guess it doesn't matter. Oh yeah, this is a bit of a shame because you, only one person who is sharing can sort of control Oh yeah. what well, the screen does. But I don't think that'll be a huge deal, but it is true. Can we just like switch off? Like, cause like we have it so that I do one of the syntheses and then she does the other one. So when I'm finished, she can just take control of the screen. So yeah, she can, like, you could do that. Things. Okay. Yeah, so you, you could do that. So you, so you would yeah. like un, un, you would like unshare and then Beth would share and then do that. Yeah, that would be good. That'd be, okay. that's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um. Mm, loading okay so and before, and before you start let me just sort of say how these two things well actually it's in your title um but how these two things are related is that um what emily and Lindsay are going to talk about are some of the chemical syntheses of shikimic acid and then your syntheses begin with shikimic acid to make tamiflu so um they're not totally related, but they're related, I guess, in that. Um, All right. All right. So Beth and I um, did the syntheses of Tamiflu from shikimic acid. So um, essentially what Tamiflu is, it's an ulcitamivir phosphate. And it's an um, antiviral drug used in the treatment or um, prevention of influenza. And it can either be sold in capsule form or as a liquid, sus liquid suspensions for like babies. And um, it's, it was approved for medical use in 1999. And in this presentation, we're gonna be kind of comparing um, two similar syntheses of Tamiflu. And one is azide free, um, probably just because azide it can be very toxic. So this is the um, first synthesis scheme and in this synthesis scheme you start with shikimic acid and then you end up with Tamiflu. Um, and then I'm going to go through um, parts of the syntheses. So in step one um, this is the shikimic acid and the toluene sulfonic acid is used um, in an acetal reaction to turn the carb to turn the carboxylic acid into an acetal. And um, the three pentanone kind of adds on to those oxygen, to the carbon groups, which is why it's kind of long here. And um, then they add the, then they add methane sulfonyl chloride to add on a methyl sulfonyl group um, to the oxygen that used to be a alcohol. And that's used as an intermediate in substitution reactions. So then in the second part, this is um, considered a borane reduction mechanism where borane is um, used to open an acetal and this sort of reaction is used to usually obtain the preferred stereochemistry or regioselectivity and um, the borane renders to the most electrophilic oxygen of one of the parts of the acetal, so I'm assuming it renders to this part. So this is kind of two steps in one, um, just because they kind of, they go with each other. So in this first step here, um, <clears throat> it's an SN2 reaction where potassium bicarbonate deprotonates the um, carboxylic acid. And um, so it's sort of like close, in efforts to close the ring, to close that carbon bond, um, this MSO leaves and the carbon bonds close forming an epoxide here. And then um, in the step four, you have sodium azide, which is used in um, nucleophilic azidolysis. 
and it allows you to open up epoxides. So in this mechanism, it's better to, I think it's easier to see in the mechanism how this kind of works. So this like long nitri uh, nitrogen group kind of um, attacks one of the carbons on the epoxide, um, forcing, it to, forcing it to open. And then um, the oxygen here with the negative charge gets protonated by this hydrogen on the NH4Cl. Um, and then you're left here with the, with the carboxylic group and um, an azide. And what happens here is this nitrogen group kind of adds from the top, changing the stereochemistry of the azide. So can I say something here real quick, Naya? Because this is interesting to me that um, what, it, what they did then, if you notice that mesolate in the beginning, which is a wedge, mm -hmm. they were able, able to substitute that in two steps with an azide, which is also a wedge. So they got it to happen with retention of stereochemistry. Um, okay. Via because it was two steps with an epoxide intermediate, so it was like two S and twos. If each one goes with inversion, then overall two inversions is the same as retention. So it's kind okay. of a nice, uh, and that's a very nice sequence. Okay. And then <clears throat> in this next step. Um, what you have here, so this reaction, um, we've never heard of it before, but it's kind of similar to something that we have seen, and it's called a Soldinger reaction, and that's where azides can be converted to amines, which is, this is an azide, and then it gets converted into this, like, cyclic amine here, and um, it's considered a mild azide reduction reaction where you use a phosphine group, and in this case, it's um, trimethylphosphine, and that's used to produce an az Azaridine, and um, so in the mechanism you can kind of see, that in, this, in this case they use triphenyl um, phosphine, but it kind of works the same way, and uh, this box should look kind of similar because it's very similar to a Vitic reaction, and um, this box is formed before the oxygen creates a bond with the phosphine group, and then the nitrogen gets protonated, and then eventually through heat, um, the this leaves is a triphenyl phosphine oxide group and it closes this ring, forming a ring around the nitrogen. And then in this step, um, what they did was they used sodium azide to re-add this azide group. And um, it comes, the sodium azide comes from the bottom. So like here you have the, like it's on like the outside wedge. And then um, the sodium azide comes from the bottom, which changes the stereochemistry of the added azide. And then the acetic anhydride is used to acetylate this hydrogen here that, used, that was part of this. And then in this last step, what they do is they use um, rainy nickel and it's used so that it doesn't reduce this alkene. And, um, but it does reduce the nitrile group here and um, then the, the H2 protonates this, uh, the amine to form an A, it's called, oh, an azonide. And um, that's one way to make Tamiflu. Nice. Okay. Nice. So a lot of three-membered ring chemistry, right? made an yeah. epoxide and opened that, and then they made that aziridine, which I'm sure none of you have seen before, which is the nitrogen version um, of an epoxide, um, that there's just, there was just like a okay. ton of stereochemical manipulation in that bottom half um, of the molecule, which you're gonna see um, now in maybe more painful detail um, in their alternative synthesis of the bottom part, I guess, of the molecule. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Naya about any of those steps? Okay, painful right. is a good way to put it. 
But so if you notice that this starting compound right here isn't shikimic acid, so there is a note on the previous slide where it's like synthesis starts here, which I think was about step three in Naya's portion. So it starts already having this epoxide formed and then it just like continues from there. So it's just like a different in the back half. And then what's interesting about this reaction is that it's azide free, like for safety, because it's toxic, but Scott also said it's like explosive. So those are two things you probably don't want to deal with. If it'll let me continue this presentation, that would be great. Cool. Okay. So this is step one, and contrary to what I originally thought, it's not a granyard. I saw magnesium and bromine, and I was like, that's what that is, but it's not. So magnesium is able to kind of coordinate with this oxygen here on the epoxide, acting as like a Lewis acid, which allows that ring to be broken more easily, and this aryl amine group to be added to this carbon, and it comes in from the top, which is why it has a wedge in the end. So you're just basically adding this amine, and then this aerial group on the end is a protecting group, which will be taken off in subsequent steps. So in step two, this is really interesting, this is how they remove this protecting group, and it can be removed just by um, hydrogenation. So here's that palladium over carbon that we're used to seeing, and then you're adding like hydrogen here, refluxing it for a while, and then they add acid just to quench it. So that's how you remove this protecting group, and they had 77% yield, which is not bad. This is, this is the one that's got noted, <laughs> if you see the little note off to the side. This was the painful part. So it happens in four steps within the same step, but you can see they got like 80% yield out of it. So that's like not bad if you do all this craziness. So I apologize, um, when, apparently when you copy things into ChemDraw into Google Slides, it makes them very blurry. So this right here, this PHCHO is just benzaldehyde, it's just a different way of writing it. And then terbutyl, methoxide, yeah, it's a solvent, and then they did it without water. So all this did was made an emine, similar to how we learned in Orgo 2. So you have an amine here, you're adding an aldehyde to it to make this emine with that double bond to the nitrogen and then that benzene group off the end. The next step is like Naya mentioned, this methane sulfon, so, so, oh, I forgot. Uh, sulfonyl, uh, chloride. sulfonyl chloride. Yeah. Sulfonyl chloride. So yeah, we've seen that now many, many times that that's, that is the equivalent of adding a tosylate to an alcohol to make it into a leaving group so you can substitute it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So it's a mesylate group instead, basically. And then this is just like triethylamine, which is a base, and that allows that to happen. So what happens here is now that you've made this into a good leaving group, that imine forms Instead of a, a zeridine, it's an zeridinium ion because now there's four bonds to this nitrogen. So it's able to like close this ring and that mesolate group is kind of ejected. And I didn't really show the stereochemistry here because it kind of gets all switched up down here in the third and fourth step. So if you notice, I kind of color coded these nitrogens because it's a little bit weird to see how they're displaced. So if you look back to the original step, the amine is here and that's in red. So this red nitrogen, with the addition of the aryl amine, gets displaced up to the second carbon instead of the first. So essentially, through all these steps, you are moving this nitrogen to this carbon, and that oxygen group that was a mesolate is now just like gone. When you add this aryl amine, it adds to the bottom face, making the stereochemistry invert, and then it's quenched with acidic water. So what you did is you just moved a nitrogen to another carbon by forming a three-membered ring and then adding an amine with a protecting group down to the bottom. So the stem stereochemistry effectively switches, like completely inverts, and you just moved a nitrogen over. So that's why it did all this like craziness in order to make it happen. That's a lot of stuff to summarize over one arrow, I, I gotta say. Do you know what I mean? This, this they part? Have <laughs> Yeah, like in, in what I gave you, it was just like step one, step two, step three, and step four in the red box. And like that just covers like a ton of changes in the molecule. Yeah. A little bit unfair, I think. It didn't. <laughs> like if you just look at this, I wouldn't, I yeah. have absolutely no idea what to do with it. Yeah. So that was a lot for them to do. Kind of, kind of rude. But now they add this acetic anhydride and a bunch of like other solvents to acetylate this nitrogen, much like in uh, Nye's, one of Nye's final steps. And then that protecting group is still there. 
then you just remove the protecting group again using hydrogenation with palladium over carbon. And then they add a phosphoric acid and you can see how it kind of coordinates over here. This is like a new um, kind of notation. So you just put a dot between it to show that like that phosphoric acid is kind of coordinating with that um, basic nitrogen. In reality, this would be NH3 plus and H2PO4 minus because they would react with each other. But um, Tamiflu is packaged and sold as ulcitam via phosphate. So that's why they have to add this uh, phosphoric acid in the end. So that's just another way of making it without using the azides. Great. There was a lot of nice chemistry in 